Thank you, Dr. Jahanpur. It's uh, again an honor to be standing in front of you. And uh, I must say, I particularly enjoyed the question and answer uh, last night. I thought it was 20 minutes of very uh, wide range and at the same time some depth of inquiry into various aspects of uh, not just the talk last night, but uh, the entire uh, investigative processes into uh, Persian literature. It seems to me as though we are standing at the threshold of a, uh, of a sea change in the way we view literature. Uh, a literature that has been as, as glorious as observation upon it has been scarce and, and, and uh, precious little insight into uh, these things. It seems to me as though for generation after generation, we have spoken about literature in literary terms, in poetic terms, in effect making love to the literature without really getting to know it. And it's high time, it seems to me, especially with the upcoming generation of whom I have had the honor of uh, being associated with quite a number. And uh, even last night I saw uh, several here among uh, the up and coming students of Persian literature who uh, must be able to bring fresh perspectives uh, into this glorious body of work, which really uh, is something that we can all be justifiably uh, proud of whether we are uh, Persian speakers or not. It's, in the end, a handiwork of uh, human beings uh, and, and generation upon generation of people trying to create beauty out of uh, all kinds of uh, pleasant and unpleasant uh, circumstances using images that at times uh, never cease to stun you in the way they relate to reality and in the diversity of thought and idea and in the ways in which they reflect uh, social reality but also reflect it, also go beyond reflecting. It's, it's, it's way beyond the mirror function literature does. It at, at times uh, provides in almost prophetic ways uh, insights into works that only generations later begin to manifest themselves in reality as we know it. So. Uh, last night, to recap, and I was asked to recap uh, the talk last night in uh, just a couple of minutes, uh, as Dr. Jahanpur mentioned, we began with a, a single image and saw this image traveling through time, through the two words, yar and diar, a place and a companion, uh, and how it defines the concept of exile when you're away from your own, uh, your own familiar place, and the people you can love, and how that uh, lack, that absence, really begins to test your humanity, in, not only your humanity, but uh, with specific ways in which you conceptualize the world and relate to it. Uh, I, as, as Dr. John Poor again mentioned today, we saw how the uh, poets of the Ghazal and the Qasida traditions uh, seem to have a locus, a particular locus, sometimes more than one locus. Uh, so when there is a, a, a native place, the place where, which raised you and which, in, in which your, your initial memories uh, are housed, uh, when you have that kind of a place, you always miss it, whether you have moved up or, or not. Uh, but if, as long as you're moving up, you do not consider yourself in exile, particularly if you, if you are if you are located in the same cultural environment. So uh, we did see poets going, let's say, from a marginal, a kind of periphery a city to <clears throat> centers such as Balkh and Bukhara and Ghazneh and Herat and various other Isfahan and Shiraz in, in the Persian world. Uh, this, is, this, this, this is a movement towards the center. But when that center rejects you and, and casts you out, then you begin to feel pangs of of, of, of exile, of separation from prestige, from power, sometimes from your own humanity. And then we moved into later centuries, let's say uh, 12th and 13th centuries, when uh, instituted the institution of the court gives rise to the institution of monastery and uh, uh, the, the Khanaqa, the uh, Sufi monastery, becomes the place of, of patronage. Uh, the career of Sanai, for example, uh, reflects that very well. An early court poet uh, who converts 
into, Christian, uh, in, into Sufism and, and begins a discourse uh, there. And we uh, followed all of that to Hafiz, where you can feel exile internally, even if you have never been exiled from your own city. Uh, then we went into the devastations that the Mongol and Tartar invasions of northern Iran wrought into that culture and the transfer of cultural centers from the greater Khorasan to Isfahan and Shiraz cities, which, are, which at that time were known as Iraq, Iraq Ajam, in other words, Western Iran. In, it was in those cities uh, that the Safavids uh, seized power and for two centuries uh, directed patronage only towards or primarily towards uh, religious uh, offerings in, 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 in the form of uh, literature. And therefore, many more secular poets began to seek their fortunes elsewhere, more importantly in northern Indian courts of, uh, of, of the Mughals of India. Uh, and then we saw a process by which uh, Persian speakers began registering a lack, an absence in their own literature. This is the time when going to school to Europe begins in late 18th century and almost all of 19th century when the caravans of Marif, Karavan Hay Marifat, the caravans of knowledge begin going to, uh, to Europe in the aftermath of the, uh, the, the uh, devastating defeats uh, of, of Persia at the hands of uh, Tsarist Russia. Uh, a process of rejuvenation, renovation settles in and eventually from that, men come out uh, who begin to change and change the discourse entirely and bring poetry and literature into the social field, uh, make of it an instrument of social change. I ended up with uh, trying, uh, and I didn't have time to do this, but in the larger project, we do have a se I do have a section where I discuss Khatrata Haj Sayyah, that's the uh, memoirs of Haj Sayyah, one of the many, many. By the way, I really recommend these, these uh, travel uh, narratives of 19th century to you all. Travel narratives and memoirs. These are new things from Hayrat Name to Khatirat uh, Taj Sultaneh and so on and so forth. You have a, 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 a whole host of texts which really have never been explored. Recently, I endorsed the book uh, published in England, I think it was, by uh, Nagme Sohrabi uh, called Taken for Wonder, uh, in which she develops a, a scheme for studying uh, these as, as works of literature, not as historical documents. And I recommend it to everyone to uh, engage themselves, those of you who are professionally in the field of Persian literature, more, more centrally with these texts. Uh, and so we came to the threshold of the 20th century when a generation after, uh, after Akhunzadeh and Kermani and Malcolm, uh, the poets uh, come who begin to uh, contribute to the modernization of Persian poetry. Oftentimes in, uh, in articulating the literary history of Persian, we still are prone to key literature to political history, which is the most, the most random and, and un, unproductive way of periodizing literature anyway. Uh, for example, we talk about Adabiyat Mashrute. Nothing happened in 1905-1906. People continued writing love, love lyrics. And, and true, certain things began to happen, but it had nothing to do with the constitutional revolution, although it predicted it and it reflected it later on. So, uh, we do need to find ways of periodizing uh, Persian literature or all of literary history as independent of political history. The predominance of uh, the, the paradigms of political history have captured our minds in such a way that we automatically uh, think that a dynasty changes and therefore literature changes. And people still talk about the literature of the Iranian revolution. Well, I'm, I must tell you, uh, the literature is doing fine. It's, it's really doing very good. Even, we even have people who, from a religious ideology, are redefining literature and are, and are, and are exploring new grounds. And so uh, I think, again, part of my effort to write literary history without distancing myself from the text is directed at getting literature, giving literature its own dynamics of change. So tonight, I will be uh, discussing uh, two modes, basically. Uh, before 
uh, the revolution. And this, this, this can be more directly key to a political event such as the Iran Revolution of 1978, 1983, um, because we're talking about exile. And much of the fact of exile came about either because of or as a result of or in the aftermath of the, uh, that revolution. As such, uh, there are topics in literature that can be key to political events. But even the Iran Revolution itself did not in literature did not begin in 1978-1979 it began in the 1970s and it manifested itself most importantly in that wonderful book Dahshab which is a record of the 10 nights of poetry reading in 1977 October 1977 as to go to Tehran and so it is uh, it, it is for us uh, cultural and literary historians and students of Persian literature and culture to find ways of of, of articulating changes in literature uh, based on literature itself and literary documentation. So uh, today, I will be discussing before that, that event, before the 1970s, let's say the, 19s, the, the late 1970s and after it. A fairly considerable portion of Iran's early modern literature was written in Europe, and much of what was not written there was inspired by 19th century European writings, often initiated through translation. That's a, a, a demonstrable fact of literary history. Almost all of the stories of the first collection of the modern Persian short stories, Muhammad Ali Jamal Zadeh's Yeki Budo Yeki Nabud, or Once Upon a Time, were written in Europe <clears throat> in the 1910s. In spite of his abundant love for his homeland, the author spent much of his long life away from Iran. The greatest fiction writer of the 20th century Iran, Sadiq Hidayat, also spent many years in Paris and in India some years and kept going back every time back to Europe every time he found the intellectual atmosphere in Tehran uh, stifling. Bozorg Alavi too lived much of his career uh, abroad in Germany. These writers' sensibilities differed both from the likes of the poets that we saw last night, let's say Saib and Bidil and Bashi and Kalim, uh, and from ours as well, uh, being only two generations uh, of, of their posterity. Uh, yet, whether it was written in Tehran or Paris or Berlin, whether its protagonists were wandering the alleyways of Baramin or Le Havre, Hedayat's fiction, for example, is first and last about Iran. So it's, it, it, we have expatriates, uh, just like the lost generation, the lost American generation in Paris in the 1920s, these people are located in exile, but they do not consider themselves exiles. They have access to the home country. They are there to read, they are there to study, they are there to enjoy life, but at the same time to create without the, the restraints and constraints that, a, a, that the political atmosphere in Tehran may impose on their work. Uh, that it depicts the angst of a pro 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 profoundly Iranian psyche, if I'm essentialize a bit to make my point, one thrown overboard into the environment of Europe may provide the most palpable index of exilic writing uh, Jamal in Jamal Zadeh's fiction. Jamal Zadeh's fiction, too, is set up in Iran and, the, uh, uh, and, and reveals uh, an innocent insubstantiality. I especially like us to get away from uh, Once Upon a Time and read those texts of uh, Jamal Zadeh that are read, read less frequently. For example, Sarotahi uh, Karbas, or Yekruz Darostam Avad Shemiran, or these texts where he uh, ruminates on, on, on his memories of Iran, and thus creates, creates works that are new to literature in the form of memoirs, in effect, although he fictionalizes them enough to be uh, truly uh, worth studying as literature. So uh, it, it, it's an innocent insubstantiality, the marker of a vanished presence uh, longing to return in imagination to the place he cannot be in reality. This is, this is important in the works of Jamal Zadeh and Hedayat, how the imagination sets in, to, uh, in, in a compensatory way to make up for the actual physical absence of the author. Certainly the specific form of Iranian European encounter, Hedayat and Jamal Zadeh foreground in the 1930s and 40s is shaped by the ambivalence they feel towards the country's attempt at westernizing modernization. That's an important uh, political factor that begins to impact uh, literature, uh, the shape of modernization in Iran, how it's, it seems half-baked to people. It seems as though it's aping Europe, but it's not really uh, linking up to anything substantial that would connect 
uh, Europe with, with, with uh, let's say, medieval Iran or pre-modern Iran. The sense of identity has developed in Iran through the first half of the 20th century and was founded on the idea of the homogeneity of Iranian culture based primarily on the supremacy of the Persian language. Now, in a couple of times, I've, you've heard me mention the supremacy of the Persian language in the larger work, I deal with it uh, in, in, in ways that may, may sound different than what I have, the, give, the impression I may have given you last night and tonight. And that is uh, that the Persian language is one of the languages of Iran. Iran is a multilingual country, whether we recognize it or not. Uh, as unfortunately, however, uh, no other language has had the continuous uh, literary production that Persian has, has had. And as such, its predominance in literature may be justified, although that should not be taken as a way of justifying the predominance uh, that's pushed by governments because they think it, it creates uh, some sort of a, the, the idea of union in the country, which, which uh, may, not, may not be true. Look at India, uh, a multilingual country but in which every language is contributing to uh, the oneness of, 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 of that country. But of course, we have not had that experience. So uh, that westernizing, westernizing modernization, uh, the, the intellectuals look at, askance at it in ways that, that make it clear they're not comfortable with it. Uh, I now want to come to uh, the second half of the 20th century. As, as the century reaches its meet, midpoint, particularly in the wake of the defeat that Iranian intellectuals suffer in the early 1950s, the desire to leave the country like so many other emotions, becomes a sought after privileged vantage point in the literary imagination. And notice I'm saying in the literary imagination, I'm not talking about biography, I'm talking about textual evidence. And textual evidence uh, codifies and articulates and, 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 and signifies desire as a particular uh, individual expresses the desire to be outside the country, whether he's serious or not, or he may want to actually leave the country is a different matter. It's, it's the evidence from the text that suggests that. Uh, poets like Shamlu, Akhavan, Farrukhzad, and Seperi, among others of their generation, register a desire to leave the country in order to show the stifling impact of a political order which would not allow their creativity to blossom by encouraging political development. Modernist poetry in particular, uh, interestingly, uh, Patriotic poetry is not a province of modernist poetry, the so-called Sherino. Uh, no. Patriotic poetry is still at this time in the hands of the traditionalists, uh, the likes of, let's say, uh, Hamidi Shirazi or various other, Radi Azarakhshi and various other poets of, of, of the middle of the 20th century who are losing ground to the modernist poetry. Modernist poetry, of course, is still affected by Nima's uh, locale, the Mazandaran province where he was, he, 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 he grew up, and also people pledge allegiance to the place, Sorab Seperi is inseparable from Kashan, and Akhavan, of course, uh, keeps going back to Khorasan, but uh, by and large patriotism, the idea of Iran uh, is not a forte of these modernists. Modernist poetry in particular privileges this desire to be elsewhere in this way. Ahmad Shamlu's early poem, uh, Punishment or Kefar, depicts the poet's persona as a noble human being imprisoned for wishing to absent himself from the country. And here, may I ask you to look at your uh, handout, number one, your handout. It comes from Kefar, and these are the concluding lines. The, the poem itself describes a prison and how a prison or is organized and what the people in prison there may have done. And then the poet distinguishes and separates himself from the old, all the other prisoners in this way. That the poet had been imprisoned because his estranged wife <laughs> sued him in the court turns out to be a minor biographical point, minor detail for scholars and literary historians to quarrel over. Yet there are in Shamlu moments of genuine affection for the homeland. The figure of the Prince of Tiles, for example, Amir Zadeh Kashiha, and the depiction of the turquoise sky of the homeland in Hejrani, which is uh, my second, uh, the second text in my handout, 
is worth paying attention to. There are only two examples of several places where real or imagined separation from homeland has instigated an eloquent lyrical voice in that tradition. And I love this poem. This is the whole poem. It's a very short one. Chahangam mizistam man kodam balidan kastan ra ke asman khodam chatr sadam list asmani az firuze neishabur ba ragehay sabz shakh saran hamchun faryad vajgun jangali dar daryachei azad ur raha hamchun aineyi ke taksirat mikonad and indeed the reversal of this this notion of a blue sky being reflected in, in, in the blue of the turquoise is, is a wonderful image, I think, especially the turquoise that, that uh, in, in my hometown of Mashhad is known as shajari, which means tree-like, and it, it has, it has uh, branches of, of, bla of black running into the wonderful blue of the turquoise, exactly like this, the lake surface that he describes. Akhavan too, nurtured and masterfully exploits the desire to be elsewhere as a trope a device for registering his protest against the stifling political environment where he actually is. In a famous early poem titled Procession, or Chabushi, composed in the 1950s, he depicts a persona who wishes to find out the truth behind the Persian expression that emphasizes the essential sameness of all places. One of the ways modernism works in Persian poetry is by questioning, questioning very old and established, established proverbs. Uh, so, uh, is a statement uh, pretending to be the truth, the ultimate truth. To, to submit it to question is a way for the, per for the modern Persian poet to say, let's examine this. So it goes against the grain of tradition, if you will. Man in jaw bas dilam tangast to har sazi ke mi binam bada hangast. Biya rahtush bardarim, qadam dar rahe bi bargasht bogzarim. ببینیم آسمان هر کجا آیا همین رنگ است. Such tactical utilizations of the desire to be elsewhere rooted in the impressively patriotic nationalism that has swept over Iran for close to two centuries creates the perception in the reader that poets are doubtless transplants from a more advanced culture. Now situated in backwaters, where only a few noble souls can grasp the glory of their presence or the, the, the extent of their suffering. In a way, uh, again, the study of romanticism, even though the word has been used about, you know, the, 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 there's some, some romantic strain in the modernist Persian uh, literature, Persian poetry, uh, it has never been investigated. And I would like somebody to do that because of, of obviously the desire for the far away and the long ago is part of the romantic tradition in Europe as well. But uh, what part it plays in the modernist Persian tradition, particularly in Iran, remains to be studied in a scholarly way. What keeps the poet in his country then becomes evidence of his selfless love and absolute commitment to his homeland. The poet is there in spite of himself, rather than because that is where he receives the adulation, the abundance of adulation and love uh, for, that all poets deserve in his estimation. In Sepehri, we have a full-fledged ideal city beyond the oceans, with many allusions uh, that would make it easy to contrast it with the poet's arrived, uh, native land. And here is uh, the poem in, in your hand, uh, number four in your handout. قایقی خواهم ساخت خواهم انداخت به آب دور خواهم شد از این خاک غریب که در آن هیچ کسی نیست که در بیشه عشق قهرمانان را بیدار کند پشت دریاها شهری است پشت دریاها شهری است که در آن وسعت خورشید به اندازه چشمان سحرخیزان است شاعران وارث آب و خرد و روشنی اند پشت دریاها شهری است قایقی باید ساخت that city of course is not a real city for the poet, but the poet painted in this case paints a city, the, the image of an ideal city uh, beyond the, the, the uh, blue waters in order to uh, register again uh, the the the, uh, the strange land in which he does not feel at home, even though he keeps returning to it in the end. And even though a generation letter, he of all the, mod, the, the, the second generation of modernists, he is being adored more than anyone else at this time. Uh, so that, that brings me to the discussion of, uh, uh, of the, the, the motif of exile, the exilic mode, 
in the literature of the diaspora that has been instigated in directly or indirectly by the Iranian revolution. For purely practical uh, per reasons, I have limited my discussion of the exilic voice in the literature of the last three decades to three basic areas of investigation. I think these are the most important uh, areas of investigation because they, in a way, they have temporal cont contiguity with one another, but you may challenge that, and, 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 and uh, people are welcome to do that. Uh, and and uh, definitely, it's much more, uh, much more sophisticated and much more complicated than, than these three. The three areas that I will concentrate on, uh, those that revolve around the operations of memory. Memory is a fantastic quality, and the more I think about it, the less I get to know it. But the more I have to say about it, it's one of those wonder, wonder, wonders of wonders, uh, how memory operates. Uh, and this operation seems to be somehow turned off even more keenly when you're away from the homeland. You keep harking back to it to prove to yourself and the people around you that you're actually alive, maybe. Uh, as, as recaptured and expressed through, the backward through backward glances and recollections, those that involve observing and absorbing. That's the second movement. You still are located here in London, in Washington, in Los Angeles, in Paris, and you need to get to know the place. And so what strategies you devise to get to know your own, your own environment, even as you, just to exist, even as you start going back to the environment that you may have left behind. <clears throat> um, and finally, those that depict the desires and dreams of exiles for return and restoration. So we have a past, a present, and the future. We have uh, memory, we have observation, and we have dreaming of return. Whatever the merits and shortcomings of this approach, it cannot be denied that these three mental operations, recollecting, observing, and dreaming, abound in the literature of exile, all exile. Uh, products of such complex processes of socialization and, and acculturation, Iranians who now live in one of the many diaspora communities around the world have had a difficult time sorting through their, their emotions about the at and attitudes toward their home and host societies. By home, I mean Iran, and by host, I mean wherever you happen to be. A great majority wishes to be able simultaneously to use the rights and opportunities available to them in their place of settlement, yet they often present themselves as exiles forced or compelled to remain abroad in spite of themselves. And that's something for our anthropology and anthro anthropology uh, colleagues and psychologists to explore. It's not the, the province of literature to enter those, even though it becomes the kind of the raw material uh, of, of, of literature itself. So uh, most importantly, for our purposes, a great majority seeks constantly to be reminded of all the real or imagined good lives that they left back Left, left, left in Iran that they had back in Iran, uh, at least until it was violently taken away from them by a catastrophic revolution and its unfortunate af aftermath. And that's, 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 again, a designation that we, the exiles, are giving to the revolution. We, ignoring all the people who love the revolution and exactly, you know, are, are seeing their dreams come true, uh, the Islamic Republic. So we tend to think that ours is the authentic notion of Iran, and it's because of that that we've been driven away. We refuse to recognize that there are people who are just fine where they are, and, and they, they love it uh, for whatever it is. Uh, so again, we have to think of this, the subjectivity involved in all of this, rather than this being any objective state of affairs. During these decades, Iranian exile sense of themselves has been shaped as a result of complex interactions between their self-definition and definitions they receive from the outside. That's interesting. I can see each one of you watching television and saying, that's not true. That's not how we are like. And yet, why not? I mean, no one, no one is, 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 is setting out to lie to us about us. Uh, it's an impression. And it needs, to be ta it needs to be taken seriously. And still, we think we know better. And they're not talking about us. They're talking about those 75 million people there. And somehow, we are a kind of tafti jodab of the kind of uh, separate breed, if you will. Uh, so a simultaneous groping and questioning process results from all of this, which is fascinating to watch through the lens of li the literary work. 
not necessarily, again, through uh, the works of anthropologists or psychologists or social scientists or whatever, or historians, but to, through the text, because it complicates to show the complexities of the, of the matter to us. So, uh, it, it, so exile is on the one hand a condition of being in the world and, and, a way of, and at the same time a way of identifying uh, oneself to others. Uh, so we are the Iranians. Uh, and, and we are not terrorists, of course, you know, regardless of what, people, what the world may think of us, of, or of, of Iranians in general. The questioning attitude that developed in exiles toward the history and traditions of their homeland may also be placed within the historical context. That's a, a fascinating topic to me. Uh, none of us remember the day of Ashura, and yet it's so, such an important event in Iran and to Iranians. But no one forgets Mehragan, and then we've added to it Esfandigan, and you know, Tirgan, and, and this and that, and you know, we, we hark back to a portion of our history, neglecting a whole segment of it, and we, come, we, we, we get furious when we see that Ahmadinejad is pushing, for example, to have the Shia narratives as, 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 as a cultural, uh, cultural product of the world recognized. I don't mind that if that, if that happens, if that's all that happens. But of course, it, it's, it will be used as a way of legitimating the government, which we think is, it does not have the legitimacy that it may, have, may once have had. So the question of participant observer becomes important, but once again, I'm here stepping outside of literature. So let me go back to the works of literature in general and see where we, what we can find there, actually. Uh, let's, let's deal with, with uh, the first, the question of memory as, as it relates to our childhood. Uh, childhood memory, memories and exilic writing is an important topic. The cluster of images that, that revolves around the theme of exile from the most dominant amalgam of, form the most dominant amalgam of expressive devices to poetry to, to portray the situation to which the speaker is made to respond or react. In, in, in literature. Life in Iran of the speaker's memory appears as real, while life in exile assumes an air of unreality. The speaker is at once is, is as sure-footed and sharp in recollecting his experiences at home as he is uncertain and flat-footed and ambivalent about his existence outside. In fact, the fullness of life experiences back home often emerges as the touchstone by which the absurdity of life in exile is measured and communicated. Uh, notice the line by Hadi Khorsani where he says, uh, So Yikshambe is unreal and unnatural, and uh, it, it has to be, it, it should have been Jom'e, but now it's all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's Yikshambe. So there's, there's that kind of articulation. Uh, the sense of alienation and loss of loss of self that the condition of exile breathes makes it impossible to feel whole. And the sense of fragmentation added to and aided by the fact of mar his marginality comes to the exile as, as, as demanding to dominate his or her discourse. Recollections of childhood are, of course, a staple of poetry in all ages, and given the nostalgic mode in Persian literature, people always idealize childhood. Farooq Farooqzad was not an exile ever in her life, and yet Anruz Ha is a beautiful poem where she uh, talks about a childhood full of fragrances and of coffee and jasmine and, and, and acacias and so on and so forth to conclude that she is now Zani Tanha, Aknun Zani Tanha, Aknun Zani Tanha. So it's, uh, the nostalgia is there, but the nostalgia serves a purpose. It's the purpose of contrasting the continuity of life. It is not lamenting absence from places of, spaces of childhood. It's a, a, different, kind of, uh, a different kind of relationship is set up in Sohrab Seperi in Sadai Payab, the sound of water's footstep, where he really talks about his early childhood as a way of arming himself with wisdom and philosophy to then preach to us about life and death and love and all kinds of things. So in a way, the relationship between childhood and adulthood is always problematic, always in contrasting and, and, and comparative terms expressed in poetry, and yet there's no rupture if you have if, if you've lived in this, lived the same spaces. Uh, whereas when, you, when you're... Uh, in exile, this separation seems as though 
a rupture, something that should not have happened to you, has happened to you, has indeed happened to you. And this uh, I see in uh, a poem by uh, Ismail Khoi, uh, who really makes it, uh, in a way, ironic. Uh, he talks about the, the spaces of London and recalls a drachte tut, a white, a white berry, uh, which is a very lowly, uh, every, everyday uh, tree in, 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 in the alleyways of Iran, and almost all courtyards have it, and it's accessible to everyone. And he contrasts, contrasts it with a stately oak, balut. And so he makes a rhyme between drachte tut and balut, which, and because it's a half rhyme, because there's a te and a ta there, uh, it makes it very ironic, highly, highly ironic. So uh, in an amazing way, poetry works to, and this, this, the ironic mode of expression in a way consoles the speaker, as if, as if he's making an attempt to reconcile himself to his Rafiq uh, Landaniam Shabalut, now that he has, he's missing the, the, the white mulberry. Uh, in a word, and I want to conclude this, and I'm you know, uh, uh, skipping quite, quite a lot here, in a word memory, that bit noir of the human mind and the beautiful damsel called imagination, while displaying apparent differences that ought in principle to make them both attractive and threatening to one another, at times set up relations that are dazzling in the rarity of occurrence. Uh, that's, that's what I'm after. <clears throat> A poetic and aesthetic way of combining, coming from that memory of, of, of the mulberry to the imagination of the balut as, as a, the Londoner friend who's, who's uh, waving to you from afar. Uh, so th that in itself may be rare, but it's, it's the kind of gem that shows the nature of exilic, uh, exilic mode in, in literature. Uh, now, as far as observing and absorbing is concerned, I deal with two uh, areas of investigation. That's the climate and culture of exile. Iran is sunny, London is rainy, forever and ever, days like this notwithstanding. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's, it's that kind of an articulation. And of course, sun is good and rain is bad. And you know, it's, 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 it's a way, it's an easy way out. And I'm already sick and tired of reading all these images of you know, climate. Um, the climate of exile. To the Iranian exile living in the city of London, London's weather is not just a condition external to human beings, one to which human beings may be acculturated and acclimated. It is what makes and breaks one's mood and one's sense of being. Far more than <clears throat> an at-home attitude, each one of us may have to our local climatic conditions. Sunny weather makes, makes you alert. Cloudy weather makes you numb, of course. In other words, the relationship between the weather out there and the mood one feels inside is immediate and automatic. And here I pause to recall a similar stratagem in the Sufi tradition. The Sufi tradition does the same thing too. So much so that you have this dichotomy, this binary opposition between Bahar and Day, or Bahar and Pais, where Bahar is a season of joy, opening up, expanding, going out there, and, 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 and uh, winter or, or, or fall are ugly seasons and seasons of, of, of rigidity and, and bending over backward and getting into yourself. Uh, uh, I recall that the, the opening line of uh, the, the Qazal, or the opening line uh, of Khabarat Hask that Ms. Shikar Arzan should. Uh, one line says, Khabarat Hask the Bidad Deye Divane, Shahne Adle Bahar Ahmadu U Zendan should. So there's always this battle whether it's Shahne and, and, and uh, uh, some, someone who is uh, who, uh, unjust or done something wrong, whether it's, it's two armies fighting one another, they are at the fight. And this happens not in so much in the Ghazal and Qasideh tradition, but in the Sufi tradition, in the Ghazals of the Sufi tradition. Uh, again, we see the same thing here, this time directed at the world out there, which is why I posited a move from uh, the objective world out there to the inside the human soul last night, uh, calling it interiorization. And now, uh, you know, it, with the ad advent of modernity, we have that interiorization turned into socialization where poetry captures the public realm. And now, of course, it becomes a, a way of distinguishing between 
exile and home, home and exile. Uh, the same thing here. Uh, this is Shah Rukh Meskub, and I love studying Meskub because he seems to me to have found out thus far, and as far as I have studied, the most successful progression of exile from incompatibility to reconciliation with spaces of exile. I think that's an important gesture. I have not seen the gesture in anyone else thus far. In his three books, Musafir Name, 1984, uh, Safar uh, late 1990s, and Safar Dar Goftugu Dar Baq, and Safar Dar Khab, one of his latest works uh, before he passed away in 2007, I think it was, or 2005. Uh, anyway, uh, each one of those books charts for me one stage of, 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 of compatibility. Uh, this first stage, is, of course, deals with climate. And here I'm dealing with uh, text number five in your hand, handout. As khane, this is the opening, the opening paragraph of Musafir Name. As khane birun amadan, tarik bud. Inja hamishe subha tarik ast. Do ta zan be saat hayishan negah mi kardan do mi dabidan. Dar talash maash. Kabutare sahar khiz kam rabai dast pache wo semej be chizi shabih rude murg nuk mi zad. Subhane dar baran. Asman misle lak ruye zamin uftade bud. Va adam ha zir chat misle lak pocht hai padraz va qarch hai saq boland. سرگردان شتاب زده چراغ ماشین ها روشن بود از نور خیسشان آب می چکید خیابان باریک ساختمان ها بلند و آسمان قایب مثل این بود که ته دریا راه می روم در تاریکی خیس اعما Talk about being feeling out of elements uh, It's an important uh, opening in that and, and here's the artistry that goes into this Every time he sees one of these unpleasant scenes, such as the two women rushing to work so early in the morning, he goes back on a cliche in his own language. And then he sees the, the dove, the pigeon, and uh, all these catchphrases that he remembers from his childhood become ways of expressing and epitomizing and condensing the, the, uh, the texture of his experience uh, when, when he feels out of element. And notice that animalization process. People are not people anymore. They resemble animals. And the animals go down in Darwinian, Darwinian uh, ladder, if you will. Uh, so in a way, he goes from animals to vegetation, to garch, mushrooms. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very well-structured articulation of an exile feeling not at home in exile. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, again, I need to uh, skip quite a bit. Uh, the narrative begins one early morning as the narrator leaves a Parisian home, etc., etc. I mentioned all of that, London at night. Uh, and this, of course, is, is, is his shuttling back and forth between Paris and London in the 1980s when he was teaching uh, Persian at the uh, Institute for Ismaili Studies and lived in Paris. And so uh, two, two days a week he would, uh, he would commute from Paris to London. And that's Mosafir uh, Nameh, a record of that. I recommend that text very, it's an easy uh, exilic text to read uh, in that it gives you clues about exile. A more poetic and lyrical, if no less emotive, contrast between home and exile appears in many of Nadirpur's exilic poems. And I believe Nadirpur never really overcame that early stage of maladjustment, of not, of in, in, incapability to adjust the, the, the spaces of exile. In one, the beauty of nature at home instills in the poet, the speaker, a poem of imaginative power uh, that enables him to ponder the certainty of return. Images of this sort are a staple in Nadirpur's exilic poetry. And here I'm alluding to, uh, to text number six in your handout. Ey mulke bi gurub, ey marz o boom peer javan bakhti, ey aashyan kohne si mor, yek ruz nagahan, chun chashmand panjar oftad be aasman, mi binam aftab tera dar barabaram. Don't ask me how. It's a forced ending. It's just a forced ending. He needs that ending to continue to live. It's, uh, there's no logic for that ending. Uh, 
that that's when, you know, it, it's, it's almost as forced as uh, the ending to Shamlu's Paria, where all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's the, all that clanking and all of that, and the revolution has happened. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing thing, the automaticity of, uh, of, of these desirable conclusions co uh, coming out of uh, undesirable processes and situations. And if you follow that in poetry, it can become a touchstone for you to know when poetry really is forced, as it is in this, in this case and in the end of Paria, and when it, it has a logic of its own and it's, it, there's premises and those premises lead to some sort of a conclusion. So, uh, if the image recalls uh, Masood Saad, and I have this, this section where I, I compare Nadirpur to Masood Saad, uh, which to me, the, the resemblance is very important to me. Uh, because it, it, it works towards irrationality, the irrationality of poetry, the, the way in which poetry becomes curative. It becomes therapeutic, if you will. Uh, it consoles the, per, the poet himself and maybe some readers. It does not satisfy any curiosity, but at least it offers some sort of, you know, band-aid uh, or, or aspirin for the headache of exile. Uh, and yet you have, you have this notion of attempting but failing to adjust. That I see in a poem by uh, Ismail Khoi again. Uh, he, capturing this mood, the speaker in Khoi's poem, Outlandia, uh, the title of the poem was uh, Bidar Koja. And Michael Beard and I, uh, as translators, tried hard to capture that Bidar Koja. And we did not fall, want to fall back on Utopia or Nakoja Abad or any, 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 any one of those um, coined or, or, or authentic Persian words. Uh, so we made up our own word, Outlandia, to use it on, in this case in particular. Uh, so celebrates everything in the place to which he has been ex exiled. And this poem appears in uh, uh, Songs of Exile. Uh, Edges of Poetry, Songs of Exile by Ismail Khoi. Capturing this mood, this, this, the speaker in Khoi's poem, Outlandia, celebrates everything in the place to which he has been exiled, i.e. London, uh, from its land and water to its culture and history as the essence of setting, setting the, setting, uh, the setting he, seems him, he sees himself in. There is, he insists, an essence to Outlandia. And he tries to discover that essence. And that essence reflects a combination of reason and experience. Still in the end, the speaker assertively registers the deep-seated negativity of his personal experience, even if it comes to make his inner feeling ineffable to himself. Why is it then, O oh God, he says, that here too, in this paradise, happiness is still my forbidden fruit? The feeling may lie be beyond reason and experience, but is the surest thing the poet has to fall back on. And here's now the text number seven in your handout. Ari behesht agar hamin jast ke dar an azari nist, vali dariq kasi ra niz be kar man kari nist. Again, uh, a, a Persian proverb, a line of poetry, a, a, a bit of poetry, behesht an jast kazari nabashat kasi ra ba kasi kari nabashat becomes the source text for this, and he tries to modify it. Uh, so he separates the car from the azar. So the azar, of course, it's good that no one is bothering you, telling you to fix your, 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 your uh, headscarf or whatever, but people don't have any car with you. They, they don't care for you. It's, it's that, that that's missing from the paradise that he sees. And of course, it's missing for him as it would be for many exiles because we are, we are foreign objects in the body of this city or any other, any other city. The cold and welcoming uh, atmosphere of exile is thus rendered even more inhospitable by the people who occupy it. And you have this high and low expression of the people you face. Uh, either people you face, you, you face in your daily passage in the streets of London or Paris or Rome or wherever are uh, re seen as lower, lower uh, hu human beings or they see as somehow frowning, not smiling, I haven't seen any, any passers-by smile at me in Tehran, and yet that doesn't matter. That doesn't seem that, in fact, I see a lot more smiles when I, uh, I, I walk the streets of Washington than in Tehran. But that objective fact is irrelevant here. If you're talking about textual, textual articulation of the condition. So, um, 
once again, I would like to uh, skip quite a bit to take you to the, no, the last part, which is an important part, and the most important part I have to deal with, and that is the question of uh, re, re, uh, dreaming, dreaming of return, <clears throat> how this dream happens. In Persian exilic literature, the urge to simultaneously mourn and create seems to have given rise to recuperating processes that lead to two distinct aesthetic tendencies. First, the experience of exile has led to more circuitous, more, more layered narratives than those that mark the, the, the normal functioning of memory as, a, as attested at home. Uh, and here, of course, there's uh, that distinction that I make between what I did last night as well, the very similar and the allegorical. You have the poems I have read thus far have been very similar. In a way, they, they have an observed fact to build or change or alter or reverse or otherwise deal with. Whereas in allegorical things, such as we saw in, in Sohrabardi's uh, text last night, and we are seeing in the couple of texts that I will uh, discuss now, uh, uh, what we have is a, an overlay. It seems as though a layer has been placed on reality. Uh, you know the concept of palimpsest, uh, these, 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 these uh, uh, either parchment or paper that wa that's washed away to make room for other, uh, other writings on top of it. It seems as though the allegory lays over the, the narrative that may have, been, may have been there, but you don't see the narrative. You can only guess at it. And here, let me apologize for um, a, a mismatch in the, in the handout. Please go to ex text number nine, not eight in your handout. This is the opening paragraph of a work called Surat al Qurab, or the Chapter of the Raven, by a uh, writer called Mahmoud Masoudi. Uh, it started being serialized in Zaman No in 1988, but then later was uh, published as a, uh, as a novel as well um, by, by the same title, Surat al Qurab, in 1996. I recommend it highly, although I'm not sure it's reading for everyone. It's a very complicated text. Basically, the, 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 the underlying text is, is, is Mantegote, the Conference of the Birds, Attar's uh, 12th century narrative. Uh, here, it's the story of a raven who, at the moment of realizing that he's not going to make it to Qaf. He is not going to make it to Qaf. He's going to die right there. So here's the opening. Uh, the opening. Man kalagam wa faqat man mandam. چنگ و منقارم خونی است و آلم شکسته و از یک چشمم خون می ریزد. حتی حالا که روی این تخت سنگ نشستم این بال که جمع کردنش دیگر کار من نیست تعادلم را به هم می زرد. پوش پرم هم خونی آشفته است زخم منقاری روی پشتم حس می کنم که درد گردنم مانع دیدنش می شود توی این سنگ سیغلی روبرو یک چشمی که به خودم نگاه می کنم یا به تو فرقی نمی کند می بینم اگرچه هنوز تک و توکی از پرهاد جور عجیبی به رفش می زند ولی کارم پاک ساخته است و دیگر هیچ جوری نمی توانم پر بکشم. Uh, it's a very uh, well constructed narrative in which the story of uh, the conference of the birds uh, is laid over by a narrative of a rat, of a someone who has ratted on his friends. Probably a, a, a political activist of the left who has uh, compromised his integrity and has broken in, in prison and has uh, cooperated, cooperated with the uh, agents, interrogators, and so on and so forth. And now he finds himself in Paris and is very, very sorry about what he has done. And uh, he, this, this story is, is his way of overcoming and reconciling himself to the fact of his own existence in, uh, in this way. Uh, it is, as, it, as a novel, it's a very difficult text. But it's also very rewarding. Once you finish it, it's really truly rewarding. And in a way, it, 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 it resembles uh, some recent strains uh, such as magical realism or surrealistic writings in, in, in the West. Uh, I want to compare and contrast this in the larger project with another very finely crafted work by Reza Qasemi, and that is Hamnawa'i uh, Shabani Orchestra Chubha. Uh, he lives in Paris, and this apparently is his first novel. It's a very well-written novel. He harks back to modern Persian literature, whereas uh, uh, Masoudi links up with a classical text, Conference of the Birds. He links up with uh, 
that wonderful image at the end of Faruq Farukhzad's Tabaludi Digar, where you see that Pari Kucheke Ramgini, Kedar Oriyanusi Maskan Dorat. And here's the, an excerpt from it. وقتی با نگرانی امارت زیبای سفیر را ترک می کردم وسط باغ درندشت آن خانه This is number 8 وسط باغ درندشت آن خانه چشمم افتاد به استخر بزرگی که وقت آمدن خالی بود و حالا چیزی داشت وسط آن موج می زد خوشکم زد پیراهن حریرش در زمینه آبی دیوار استخر موج بر می داشت و هوش را میان خواب و بیداری معلق می کرد پری دریایی کوچکی را می دیدم که از آبهای دور دست بین استخر خالی تبعید شده بود و در حسرت دریای گم شده آواز اندوه سر می داد. Uh, I'm surprised and pleasantly so by the number of uh, these exilic texts that uh, link up with and hark back to the classical texts of classical and modern uh, Persian liter literary texts. Uh, Tubama Manoy Shab, as you know, links up with uh, uh, that wonderful scene in, in, in Hedayat's, uh, Hedayat's Blind Owl. And here we have another analog of that. It seems as though uh, now modernism finds itself at home enough speaking lit in, in terms of literature, not in terms of uh, the location of the author, to now make its, its, its compact with the classical texts. There was a time, and of course it's ha this happens in many traditions, where you have the battle of the ancients and the moderns, and the moderns call the ancients' works rubbish, and the, 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 the traditionalists call the works of the moderns garbage, uh, but then there, there comes a reconciliation. I'm the, I'm, I, I recall Ezra Pound's uh, making compact with Walt Whitman, for example, uh, let, the, let there be trade between us. Uh, so they're, they're, they established trade uh, between their own texts and the, t the established texts of the tradition. Uh, finally, let me read you one more, and that's the last uh, text in your handout. And this is from the uh, final pages of, uh, of Shah Rukh Meskub's last uh, fic fictional work, Safar uh, Dar Khab. He dreams that he has returned to his native city of Isfahan uh, in the in the company of and under the uh, guidance of uh, Khaja Amid, uh, one of the makers of Isfahan in the Saljuqi period. Um, and he is looking for his baby brother. And he sees him. در حاشیه شبه برادر خورد سالم را می بینم در جستجوی من است. اما پیدایم نمی کند. تا سرک می کشد زیر پای انبوه مؤمنان و شهیدان که با تقلای دردناکی خود را به سوی آسمان عبوس می کشند لگد مال می شود. از بیچارگی عشق می ریزد. بی خیشتن فریاد می کشم. می دانم که صدایم را نمی شنود و تازه اگر بشنود من دیگر نیستم که او می شناخت. Have you thought that you, you will not be, you will not be uh, the one, you, you will not be recognized by any deceased person than you, that you may have loved? We always work on that, on the assumption that they'd recognize us if they see us, uh, whenever. But can you imagine them passing by and not paying any attention to you? It's that kind of a, uh, a, final, a final break with all, all manner of uh, reconciliation and at the same time reconciling yourself to your new spaces. So uh, again, I have much that I have left out and I apologize. Uh, let me very quickly recap that in the last two talks, that uh, last night and tonight, uh, we have really scratched the surface only. Uh, and I hope I have given you some clues about how to approach these texts, these texts of, uh, of exile, and how to follow the exilic mode in Persian literature. Uh, one thing is for sure, and that is, as I said, uh, my attempt as, 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 as hopeless as it might be, is to find my way from the text to history, not in contravention of the text, not ignoring the text to reach history, as literary historians typically have done thus far, but to exploit the resources of the text to uh, give me clues as to how to register and how to examine and how to at least begin to see uh, those motifs that become uh, registers of change in Persian literature. Once again, I thank you for your patience and I thank Dr. Hakimian for, my, for inviting me. Thank you very much.